Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm really uh, pleased uh, here to, to be there to be the, the co-moderator uh, for the third session of the European Climate and Health Responder courses. This session will be about wildfires and air quality. And it will be the first uh, session among the 10. Uh, so that's, um, that's a course schedule that will end at the, at the 9th of April. So the main uh, objectives of this session is, uh, first of all, to understand the links between changes in precipitation regimes, elevated temperatures, and increasing wildfire risk, and know how climate change will exacerbate these different risks. The other learning objective is to identify health risks associated with wildfires, smoke, and degradation of air quality. We will focus on vulnerable population. Then to compare the risk associated with other sources of air pollutants and to highlight the role of wildfire smoke on other diseases. And then finally, understand how the different hazard systems and different policies could help to mitigate these different risks. So uh, I will um, now um, give you some information about the logistics, but you 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 start to know well uh, if it's your first session. So actually, uh, this is a 19-minute session uh, divided in uh, three parts. The first part will be a lecture uh, of 45 minutes with some questions, and then two case studies of 10 minutes each. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, I also can ask you to enter the question in the Q&A box, not in the chat, but in the Q&A box. So um, we will probably not answer all the questions, so I, I, can, uh, I can ask the presenter uh, for the question that could not be answered to, to respond them offline and uh, upload this document uh, with, the, with the presentation that could be uh, shared with the, with the presentation uh, and the slide deck. Also, I remind you that uh, this session and all the others uh, are, are recorded actually and will be posted on the website within the next 24 hours. And also that all the different reference materials and slide decks will also be included on the website at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> Also, uh, this uh, this uh, session, this responder course, will give you a certificate of participation for the participant who entered more than 70% of live sessions and passed the final exam with a score of more than 70% at the end of the course. And these people will be awarded the certificate of participation in climate and health from the co-organizer of this, uh, this, uh, <laughs> this course, the Association of School of Public Health, uh, of European uh, region and the Global Climate Change and Health Education Center. The participant must join each class session using their personal and unique Zoom links and complete the final exam using the email address that is used to initially register for the course. This attendance, I remind, will be automatically recorded during the live Zoom sessions. Then at the end of the course, the exam link will be sent on the final day of the class via email and will remain open for 48 hours. The certificate will be given uh, one week later, the final course on April 16th this year. So now I will present quickly uh, the different uh, presenter today. So we have uh, as a lecturer, Dr. Uh, and Professor Tariq Ben Marnia. Uh, from University of California, San Diego Scripps Institution of Oceanography and School of Medicine in USA. We will have uh, for the first case study, Susana Viegas, which is assistant professor in Nova National School of Public Health and Department of Occupational and Environmental Health in Portugal. And as a second case study, Dr. Georgios Sarilis, associate professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering in the University of Thessaly in Greece. So I want to thank you and just remind you that we have a post-session survey 
uh, th that you could access uh, by, uh, by a scan with the phone camera, this uh, QR code that is actually on the screen, or you can also type on the chat and uh, take the link on the chat. And we can also have this, uh, this post-session survey on the GCC HA uh, website. So I will introduce our first uh, presenter. So <clears throat> Tarek Bernmarnia is uh, actually an environmental epidemiologist with a joint appointment at the University of California, San Diego, Scripps Institution of Oceanography and School of Medicine. His, re his research interests include the impact of extreme weather events on human health in the context of climate change enhancing the notion of vulnerability and its implication for public policy. He also develops methodological approaches in order to evaluate the health impact of environmental policies such as climate change adaptation measures and air pollution regulation. He was recently selected as an associate editor for Environmental Health Perspective and gives several public lectures, including uh, Great Science Center or Time, Los Angeles Times and National Geographic. So Tariq, I let you start the presentation okay. for 45 minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Yanis. And hi, everybody. Apparently, a lot of people. So let me share my screen and make sure everything is, looks fine on all sides. So, okay, so let's start the timer just to make sure I stay on time. So, good morning, afternoon, evening. It seems that we have people all around the world. So yeah, I'm very happy to be here and thanks for the invitation and thanks Yanis for the introduction and for the organizers of this session. So today I will talk about uh, what do we know about wildfire, smoke and human health. I will discuss about what do we know about the epidemiological evidence and what are the research gaps. So this is how I will organize this session. So that's the outline, the menu for today. So I will first give an example about California, which is what I know best, um, in terms of why, how can we connect the links between climate change, climate viability, and wildfire, and why do we see more and more wildfires in the context of climate change, and why, more importantly, do we see a specific change in the seasonality of this wildfire? And then I will talk specifically about wildfire smoke and how we can study the impacts of human health, and what, what do we know about that, and what are the new challenges? So we provide you with, um, brief overview of the epidemiological literature, what do we know and what we don't. And, and then we'll talk about some new directions in this area of research. So I think you have the Q&A, if you have any questions, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can, so don't hesitate. Okay, so first, as a motiva motivating example, I will talk about California. So this is just like something that we see obviously in California, but we also see in many places in the world. This is that will be with some slight differences, including the seasonality that what someone presenting from Australia can show you or someone presenting from Chile can show you or from South Africa, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just so a pattern. So you can see on the right, this figure, I assume you can see my mouse, but this is here just like all wildfires that have been recorded in California since we recorded wildfire, which is more, more or less one century ago. And here you can see the top 20 largest California wildfires. And you can see a quite special and specific and unambiguous pattern where we see that like among the largest wildfires that took place since we recorded them, most of them are going, uh, took place in the last like five to six years. And you can see that this pattern is quite obvious. And um, on the left, which is also an important information, besides uh, increase in the intensity and severity of this wildfire, we can also see a change in the seasonality of it. So what it means is that instead of having just wildfires taking place, which was the case a few decades ago between May and September, now we see that these wildfires and the largest of them are taking place during the fall season between October and December. And now I will explain you why do we see this pattern. And that will be just uh, a way to connect and to explain how climate change in a very indirect and sneaky way is influencing this kind of spatial and temporal distribution of wildfires. So all of these data can be found in a Cal Fire department 
website and you have a lot of figures and nice uh, plots that you can you can have access to and data as well. So, so there are two components, sorry, there are two components that I will emphasize. The first one is what we call changes in precipitation regime. So what do we call, what do we mean by precipitation regime is just like, uh, what is the distribution of precipitation events in a given year? So, and what we observe specifically in what we call Mediterranean regions, which include the Mediterranean regions, like the true Mediterranean regions, like for example, including Greece, Spain, Portugal, et cetera, uh, also Chile, also California, uh, South Africa and Australia, we see that there is just a very strong change in precipitation regime that is strongly connected with climate change and climate viability. But what is very special in the context of California is that we see that we have overall less raining days, but at the same time, we have more extreme events, just, such as what we observed in the last few weeks, which has driven that what we call atmospheric rivers. So there is a signal uh, between climate change and the intensity and the seasonality of atmospheric rivers. So what it means is overall, we have less, not extreme precipitation events. But on the other hand, we have just like very extreme precipitation events that are driven by atmospheric rivers that have a very, very strong seasonality, which means that we have more or less the same amount of rain in a given year, but that will be concentrated in only a few days. And these few days will have a very strong seasonality, which is typically now between February and March. So that's the first component. So what it means is we have a lot of precipitation typically like right now, and then it's followed by a long period of drought when the summer starts. So then during the summer, we have like an increase in like in hot temperature. So we have a lot, a lot of vegetation because of this huge amount of precipitation that will just dry out and be perfectly ready to burn. And that's the first component. The so second component, and that is very specific to, to California, is that we have very strong downslope winds that have a very, very specific seasonality. And in, um, so as I said, at the end of the summer, we have a lot of vegetation because of a huge amount of precipitation that took place during the winter. And we have a lot of uh, hot temperature and drought following this atmospheric river events. And then we have a lot of dry vegetation that is perfectly ready to burn. And, then, and in September, this is when the like, specific winds in Southern California, we have what we call the Santana wind, which are very strong and hot. Um, downslope winds that may have a very huge influence on this wildfire because first that they will bring hot temperatures so that will contribute to further drying out the soil and, and ex exacerbating evapotranspiration, but they will also trigger and expand wildfire when they start. But on top of that, they will also contribute to transport the smoke to the coastal area where was, most of the population is living. So. Here, yeah, I'm, I'm just mentioning these two components to say that without this very specific seasonality or, when direct, or direction of this specific type of downstream wind, we would not have this type of wildfire. We would not have this very strong wildfire. If the seasonality was different, we would not see that. Uh, if the preci precipitation regime was very different, for example, if it was purely like drought conditions, we would not see this huge amount, like this huge increase in severe wildfire. This is a combination of these two components that explain why we see not only an increase in the intensity and severity of this wildfire, but also a very, very specific seasonality taking place in a, in a fall because of the combination of these two components. So I just wanted to start by that just to explain you like how the connections between climate change and climate viability and these this, this, this different types of like increase in intensity and a change in seasonality of wildfire can be explained. Just to give an intuition about how we can connect climate change and this type of extreme events. So now I will talk about smoke. So usually we distinguish the, what we call the direct impact when there was a wildfire on public health uh, from the indirect impact. So when we talk about the direct impact, we mostly talk about communities that will be directly impacted. And we talk mostly about injuries, about intoxication for carbon monoxide, which is a leading cause of, of deaths like among uh, nearby communities. And also a lot of uh, issues in, in involving like economic uh, security, how, like losing, losing homes, et cetera. So this is what we call direct impacts. And usually, Unfortunately, uh, this type of direct impact uh, include very like a very small number of communities, very small, small number of people. But in parallel, 
as I mentioned before, when there is a wildfire, there is also a lot of smoke that will be generated. And the smoke can be transported over a very, very long distance, like hundreds and thousands of miles even. And that is what I will focus on today. I will mostly talk about smoke as a public health issue because it's going to affect a huge amount of individuals. So when we focus on smoke, so this is a complex mixture, but it's mostly composed by what we call PM2.5, fine particles. And I will talk more about that later. So here I will mostly focus about smoke and PM2.5 fine particles component. And we have a lot of evidence from the epidemiological literature about how PM2.5 fine particles can be associated with so many health issues, including like hospitalization for different respiratory or cardiovascular causes, for example. It can be associated with a lot of chronic diseases and also birth outcomes, maternal complications, et cetera. So we have a lot of evidence uh, from PM2.5 that can be generated by different sources like traffic, agricultural emissions, industrial emissions, and wildfire smoke. So wildfire smoke is only one of the main, many contributors of emission of PM2.5. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is what make wildfire and wildfire smoke a specific contributor to PM2.5 and a potential health burden. Because on one hand, we've seen, especially in California, but in many places in the world, a decrease in PM2.5 the last few decades, mostly because of the implementation of different types of uh, transportation and other types of policy, urban planning policies. However, while we see this decrease, we saw this decrease in the last few decades, we see that this pattern is being reversed. And I will show you a paper that had been published a few months ago depicting that. And this is also what we can see in terms of projections when we use different type of climate projections to try to predict uh, what would be the kind of the like the distribution of different sources of PM2.5 in the next few decades, we can see that in the next few decades, the majority of PM2.5 will be coming from fire emissions. So basically saying that because of climate change, PM2.5, at least in California, is becoming a wildfire smog problem and not a transportation, agricultural, or industrial problem. This is really like a big shift. So that's the first component about why this is an issue. Here, this is also just to demonstrate the important role of Santa Ana wind, as I mentioned before, on smoke transportation and PM2.5. So here, this is just like a very simple kind of uh, like time series analysis and and just we analyzed like time varying correlation between Santa Ana wind intensity and uh, PM2.5 on a coast where most population live. This is just um, a snapshot of Southern California. We can see here San Diego and here, like the Orange County in Los Angeles. And uh, here you can see in blue, the negative correlation between Santa Ana wind intensity and the level of the concentration of PM2.5 from any source on a coast. And here you can see that sometimes you have a very high positive correlation. So you can see in blue, what it means is that usually when there is a Santana wind event, it contributes to reduce PM2.5 contribution because it basically blows away the PM2.5 to the sea, to the ocean. But sometimes this kind of like positive impact of Santana wind of air pollution is going to be canceled and reversed because of specific events. And this red positive correlation co coincide exactly uh, with wildfire events that will play that will take place inland so this is just to show that when there is a wildfire taking place inland like the santa santa Ana, when the vents are going to blow the smoke to the coast and contribute to a huge increase in pm 2.5 it's just to show you an example about the mechanisms to which pm 2.5 from smoke is going to affect huge amount of populations so this is a study i mentioned before that has been published a few months ago, just to show how in the Western US, speci specifically uh, wildfire smoke is basically canceling out decades of air quality improvements benefits, be mostly because of the policy. So we can see here, just if we fo focus, for example, on the Western US, you see like a trend in terms of decrease in PM 2.5 in the last two decades. And you can see that this trend is being reversed right now. And in this paper, they demonstrated that this, this reverse, like this, kind of reverse trend can be mostly explained by the increase in you know, intensity and specific seasonality of wildfire smoke PM2.5. So this is just to demonstrate that at least in Western US, but that's the case in multiple Mediterranean region, like in the world, wildfire is becoming the main air pollution problem. So now I will talk about why do we care about that as public health researchers? So first I will talk about PM2.5 in general. 
So we know quite well, and we have a lot of toxicological and epidemiological evidence about how PM2.5 in a short-term way or long-term way is going to be associated with multiple health impacts. And the main mechanism, and I'm not going to spend too much time de describing the mechanism, but there are three types of mechanisms that we usually refer to when you try to explain how PM2.5 is going to impact human health. But first, one thing just to understand about, first in the first place, why do we even care about PM2.5? What do we regulate PM2.5 based on this specific size? So because PM, which stands for particulate matter, and 2.5 is 2.5 micrometer. So, the reason for which this is a specific size that we are actually focusing on and that is actually regulated is because 2.5 micrometer is a size that the aerosol, a particulate matter, needs to penetrate into the lungs and then interacts and interacts with the alveola. This is where the oxygen and the blood stream are just like exchanging. So the reason for which we focus on this specific size of particulate matter aerosols is because this is a size that is needed to get into the circulation system. So once uh, a specific aerosol is going to penetrate and get into the circulation system, the bloodstream, uh, it can affect multiple organs. And this is why we are quite uh, focusing on this specific type of specific size for this type of particulate matter. And one thing that I will I will mention later is that this is only based on the size. We're not talking about what is inside this specific aerosol. And you will see that this is quite important specifically uh, for how air pollution regulations are designed nowadays. But this main mechanism through which PM2.5 is going to impact human health include inflammation that could be localized or could be generalized, uh, oxidative stress, which can be summarized as a kind of aging of cells, acceleration of the aging of cells and could be an alteration of different types of cells and also the alteration of the like immune system. So basically when we're exposed to high level of PM2.5, the immune response can be altered so there are many, many studies showing how macrophages, which are responsible of the human, human function, are going to be not as active and not as effective when we are exposed to high level of PM2.5. So this is just briefly what, why we are concerned about this specific type of issue. And again, the, we distinguish typically acute from chronic impacts. So we have just like daily fluctuation in terms of PM2.5 that can be associated with some exacerbation of existing health issues. Like for example, someone living with asthma may have asthma exacerbation when there is um, like an increase in daily levels of PM2.5. But in parallel, when someone is going to be exposed like, like over multiple years to high level of PM2.5, we know now that PM2.5, like long-term exposure to PM2.5 can be associated with different types of cancer, uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, and other types of chronic diseases, including diabetes, for example. So this is just to mention that we distinguish typically daily or, yeah, or short-term versus long-term exposure and acute and chronic impacts. So now, one thing that I will talk about is, and it, why do we care about wildfire smoke and why do we need this specific type of information? Because as I said, we only focus on PM2.5 based on the size, but the composition actually matters a lot. And the composition of PM2.5 when generated from wildfire smoke is quite different and can have huge impact on how we think about the human health response. And I will show you in a few slides why it matters. So there is some evidence from the toxicological literature showing that when uh, mice were exposed to wood smoke, like the dose response, like the response in a mice population was systematically higher when they were exposed compared to PM2.5 generated by traffic emissions, for example. And the pattern that they showed was that the dose response, the kind of the toxicity was up to um, uh, 10 times higher uh, as compared to PM2.5 generated from that, what we call traditional sources of emission like traffic. And this is what we wanted to check. And this is what we, what we wanted to assess on a human population. And we did an epidemiological study that I will present in a few slides. So why do we care? And why the, the composition of particulate matter and aerosol actually matters? It's because this is just a size, but the specific chemical composition, the specific chemical speciation uh, are going to matter. And uh, what, there is a specific component that we really focus on when we are trying to understand about like this specific differential impact according to the composition and source of emission is what we call oxidative potential. This is like 
one way, simple way to summarize that is one like for a given pollutant, for a given PM, for a given aerosol, what is the potential, like the potential, like negative impact that is this, or the potential reactiveness that this specific PM will have on a body. And you will see that this is very important when you think about wildfire smoke PM 2.5. And I will show you a few, few results later and explain why we see these results, because the answer is that we see that PM 2.5 generated from wildfire smoke is systematically more impactful, more toxic than PM 2.5 from other sources of emission like traffic, agriculture, and industries. And that can be explained mostly by this potential oxidative stress. So here, this is just a slight, a quick connection with policy, because you probably know or heard about that is that so like one one typical way to to think and regulate or just intervene on air pollution is through air quality standards so you probably heard about the who the world health organization air quality guidelines which just provide a specific just like goal which is just like is not enforceable, is not enforced, but just provide a specific goal for target for specific entities. And then organizations that actually can enforce this type of standards, like such as the EPA in the US or other organization in Europe or in other parts of the world are going to have specific values. So typically for PM 2.5, for example, uh, we distinguish short-term exposure daily, like the exposure across 24 hours, from long-term exposure, which is typically used using the annual, annual average of PM2.5. But what is important here is that uh, we these thresholds are, no, are not based on any epidemiological or toxicological evidence because what we know right now is that there is no safe threshold. So any exposure to PM2.5 or to air pollution in general is going to be associated with a given risk. Of course, there is a dose response. Usually it follows a log linear those response, but there is always a risk associated with a given exposure. So there is no safe threshold. So this is always a compromise trade-off. So that is very important to know. And more importantly, for PM 2.5, the regulation right now and everywhere, this is the case in the US, in Canada, in Europe, and multiple places and any places in the world, doesn't distinguish the viability in terms of PM2, like PM2.5 or PM10 composition, which means that whatever the source of emission, the regulation and the target will be exactly the same. And what I'm, I would like to just like convince you of today is that this needs to change, especially in regions that are going to be affected by wildfire. And also another issue, which is uh, quite not specific to wildfire, but still quite important is that not all communities are vulnerable in the same way, susceptible in the same way to PM 2.5 in general and PM 2.5 from wildfire as well. And this is what we typically refer to as environmental justice, where we distinguish like differential susceptibility from differential exposure. So this environmental justice component of air pollution is critical and have, has been documented a lot. And that is something that is not considered at all in air pollution regulation right now. And that, and finally, another thing that is not uh, discussed and, and considered at all in existing regulation is this potential compounding impacts when, for example, you will have a wildfire smoke event or air pollution event from ozone, for example, but at the same time, you will have an extreme heat event. Of course, you will have what we call a synergistic effect. And we'll mention a few studies at the end about how we can document that and like specific evidence about this compounded synergistic effect. But right now, no regulation is taking, taking that into consideration. So just to say why, what we do and what I'm going to show you today is it matters in terms of air, poll air pollution policies because we need to update and we need to take that, this kind of new air pollution sources of emission in context of climate change into consideration and also the importance of taking into consideration the environmental justice aspect of this air pollution issue. So very briefly, and I put a lot of references uh, that are um, open access, uh, you, if I'm not wrong, just to summarize, what do we know right now in terms of wildfire smoke, PM 2.5 specifically, and human health impact? So we have a lot of evidence. There are a lot of studies that have been conducted specifically in the last two decades in different places of the world. And I will show you a map on the next slide, on a few slides for now. There are a lot of existing systematic review. So here I've, I've listed a few. And what we know is that when there is a wildfire smoke event, we see an increase in different types of respiratory issues. 
uh, in terms of like in, that can include asthma, COPD, and like there are also some studies showing how different types of like seasonal respiratory diseases and infectious diseases such as the seasonal flu, for example, and even COVID are going to be exacerbated in a context of wildfire events. We also have some evidence on cardiovascular diseases, but you will see and we show an example in California in a few slides about how the, like the temporal, like the, the temporal patterns are a little bit more um, different than respiratory impacts. And of course, there is a lot of studies showing how when we see a wildfire smoke event, we see an increase in premature mortality. We also have some evidence about some population being more vulnerable more susceptible. In this presentation, I don't, I don't distinguish susceptibility from vulnerability, even if that could be discussed. But this is just to say that some subgroups of the community based on age or socioeconomic status or race ethnicity are going to be more impacted for the same concentration of wildfire smoke PM2.5. Some subgroups of the community are going to be more impacted. So the risk of being hospitalized, for example, is going to be higher. But there is still a lot of work to do in this area, in this area because there are so many susceptibility features, characteristics, and profiles that we still don't understand. So this is just like basically what we know for sure in relation to wildfire smoke and adult health. And there is some evidence, evidence showing how wildfire smoke is also associated with different types of birth outcomes and children's health issues, including asthma, asthma risk, and asthma exacerbation among kids. So this is basically what we know. And here very briefly, I will, I will mention how do we study and how like these studies that have been included in this review have been conducted. So in a nutshell, we typically distinguish two types of approaches. So on, in, on one hand, we're going to focus on specific large wildfire events that could, for example, be the big wildfire events taking place in October 2007 in Southern California or the 2010 wildfire event in Russia, or other types of events, including the campfire in 2018. So that's, a, that's typically one type of study. In parallel, we can also be interested by a long time series. We, can, we want to model multiple wildfire events over, for example, 10, 15 years, and we want to overall assess what is the dose response relationship and what is the impact associated with wildfire smoke PM2.5 in general across multiple years. And to do that, and I'm not going to spend too much time on that because obviously this is a little bit uh, beyond the scope of this presentation about how we actually model that. But the only thing that I wanted to say is that we typically distinguish two types of modeling approaches, the dynamical approaches and statistical approaches. So briefly, dynamical approaches are going to include models such as chemical transport models or dispersion models. This is one way to intuitively think about it. It's like a video game in which we're going to have some physical and uh, biological patterns and parameters. And we're going to try to simulate what, when there is a wildfire, including some weather characteristics, vegetation characteristics, wind characteristics, atmospheric condition characteristics, etc. We're going to simulate how much smoke is going to be generated and how, how much PM 2.5 is going to be generated, where the smoke is going and how much smoke is going to be in a given place uh, on a given day. So that's typically one way to handle this type of issue by using a dynamical, including a chemical chemical transport model. One of the most commonly used chemical transport model is, 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 is called Geoscam. Uh, in the US, we also use another type of uh, chemical transport model from WARF, which is another type of dynamical model, but there are different models on the market and that's one way to model this type of issue. An alternative way to model uh, exposure to wildfire smoke PM2.5 is based on statistical approaches. In this context, instead of having this type of dynamical model, we're going to move to use like different types of measurements, including stations, like, like, like stations that monitor PM2.5, for example, and also satellite products. And we're going to try to use statistical techniques, most of the time using different types of machine learning algorithm, and we're going to combine them into what we call an ensemble model. And we're going to try to estimate, to calculate how much PM2.5 can be actually attributable to wildfire smoke PM2.5. So I'm not going to spend more time on that, just to make sure I, we stay on time. But I, I included a few references. And here, this is just a list of the different type of products and variables that we can typically use in this setting for those who are interested by this specific, aspe this specific type of aspect, aspects. Here, this is just an example of, in Southern California where we combine 
fire parameter, like uh, satellite images of the smoke and wind data. So we can really understand why the, like the wildfire is, where the smoke is going and what is a specific influence of uh, like wind vectors. But this is just to give you an idea. This is some example about uh, chemical transport models applied to epidemiological studies. And here this is just a summary of a statistical approach that we developed actually a few years ago to actually isolate uh, PM2.5 that is specific to wildfire smoke using machine learning algorithms. So you have the reference here, and this is just a quick summary of that, but I'm not going to spend too much time on that just to make sure I stay on time. And uh, but all of that to say that we can actually use these methods to try to isolate PM2.5 from wildfire smoke PM2.5 as compared to traditional other sources of PM2.5, such as traffic. And this is what we did in this, in this study that we published a few years ago. And here we really wanted to see if on a, at the population level, epidemiologically, we would see the same pattern as in toxicolog toxicological study. So do we see that for the same concentration, for the same dose, for the same amount of PM2.5, when it generated by wildfire smoke, do we see the same impact uh, uh, on the population level on respiratory issues, for example, as compared to traditional sources of PM2.5, mostly traffic in Southern California? And the answer is not at all. And here, for example, just focus on this specific comparison. So hopefully you can see my mouse, but here you can see the specific dose response to so the increase in the risk of being hospitalized for respiratory reason when there is an increase of 10 units of PM2.5 from any source, like some, sorry, from non-smoke sources, this is a specific contrast, 0 0.87. But here, this is the same for the same concentration for an increase in 10 units of wildfire smoke PM2.5. We can see that the dose response or so the probability, the so increased probability of being hospitalized is up to 10 times higher, which coincides exactly with what the toxicological evidence uh, has suggested more than 10 years ago. And we replicated that in multi for multiple population in different contexts. And this is exactly what we what we see in a very consistent way, showing that wildfire smoke is um, way more toxic, way more dangerous than PM2.5 from traditional sources of um, emission of PM2.5. And just briefly, why? Why is it the case? The main reason for which we suspect this type of emission to be to, to, to lead to more toxic PM2.5 is mostly because of the temperature at which this PM are going to be generated. Because as you may know or not, PM2.5 and multiple components or multiple pollutants, sorry, are going to be generated in a context of incomplete combustion. But here, what differs a lot between vegetation burning and like uh, traffic, traffic rated um, PM2.5 emission will be the temperature at which this PM2.5 is going to be generated. So this is the main reason for which we suspect PM2.5 generated by wildfires to be more toxic is because of the temperature at which this PM are going to be generated, which is significantly more like higher and will have what we call a higher oxidative potential. So because of the temperature, uh, that will be higher, the potential oxidative stress that this, this, this PM will have will be higher. This is what we suspect right now about why this wildfire PM2.5 smoke needs to be regulated in a different way because the toxicity is way higher. So this is the first big point that I wanted to mention today. So for the last six to seven, like, let's say eight to 10 minutes, I want to talk about just like other consideration and, and other types of study design and also what we don't know. So before getting into what we don't know, I just wanted to give you a few examples about uh, how we can study specific type of health impact for specific wildfire events. And usually in this concept, in this context, we rely on study designs that are a little bit different. We, in this context, we typically treat a wildfire event, so occurrence of a specific wildfire event as what we call a natural experiment. So we really try to understand what will be the counterfactual values, the counterfactual number of people being hospitalized in the absence of this wildfire. And we are going to try to like to estimate that. So this is just involving different types of study design. Of course, I'm not going to describe that to explain what a natural experiment or different types of quasi-experimental me method design that could be employed in, in such setting, but just to give you an intuition. And if you're interested by that, you have all of the references uh, just to, to explore this topic further. So let me skip that. This I just want, uh, as I was this example 
of the lilac fire that we analyzed as a single event and as a natural experiment. So this is a fire that took place early December in 2017 in San Diego. So this is, here you can see the county of San Diego. And here this is where the fire took place. And here this is just a snapshot of what we, for example, use. This is a fire pyramid perimeter of the lilac fire and here this is a smoke and here you can see all of the the the, the, the wind direction vectors and uh, so what we did we simply just uh, treated this as a, a like a interrupted time series analysis which means that we considered like the kind of uh, time series of the hospital admission data, um, uh, like focusing on a pediatric population in a radius hospital. And we want you to see if we were observing a specific, like huge shift, a huge increase in a rate of this hospital admission for the pediatric population in San Diego. And here, this is exactly what we saw. So we see, for example, like uh, absolute number of between 16 and 17 additional uh, hospital admission among the pediatric populations that were happening because of this wildfire event. And if you calculate, this is more or less 50% of the hospital admission rate in San Diego. So this is quite substantial. So because of the wildfire, as uh, this specific lilac fire, we saw like up to 15, like 50% 50 increase in the number of hospital admission for the pediatric population only in San Diego. So that's just to show how this type of event can have a substantial impact. So I'm going to skip the details, just uh, analyzing the subgroups and explaining why and how we did this falsification test, because just to make sure I go through all of the slides, but you have all of these details. You have the reference, the reference of this study here if you're more interested. And if you have any question, I should be available to get back to you by email eventually. Uh, this is just another study here where we can we emphasize the specific spatial variability of this impact. So here, this is just to show how the hospital admission and the number of hospital admission that are specifically attributable to wildfire smoke actually vary and follow the smoke. So here, this is just to show when the smoke is generated here, you can see that the excess hospitalization is happening. It's, it's taking place here exactly as compared to a few hours later or a few days later, we can see that the smoke changed and this is where the burden is taking place. So this is just, we wanted to emphasize a specific spatial variability component of these impacts and this is what I wanted to emphasize very quickly here. I will skip that. Um, this is just a study that we published, I think, last year, just to show the impact of different types of wildfire smoke events between 2016 and 2019 for multiple, like multiple medical causes. So here we, we can see like a quite consistent uh, impact on respiratory causes of ha hospital admissions. And here you can see that asthma is by far the more, like the more predominant cause of hospital admission in California for the general population, for the adult population. And here you can see what we, we can see what we observe for cardiovascular diabetes and mental health causes of hospital admissions. And one thing that I wanted to point out is how, for example, there is a specific lag effect in relation to cardiovascular event, which basically means that when there is a wildfire, smoke event taking place in a given community, people are going to be impacted in, for the, in, in terms of cardiovascular issue, but this impact can take up to one or two weeks to just to be to show up in the data. And, and that is something that was quite interesting to see how we can see this delayed effect of wildfire smoke on the cardiovascular system. So this is just what I wanted to emphasize. Here, this is also to show how this burden is unequally, unequ unequally uh, distributed. And this is a study we conducted in San Diego showing how unhoused uh, individuals, population, pop individuals experiencing homelessness are going to be suffering way more than uh, their counterparts that are not experiencing homelessness. And here, and here, this is also to show how this is quite specific to wildfire smoke PM 2.5. And here, this is just very briefly to show how when there is a specific smoke event, how individuals being unhoused or experiencing homelessness are going to be systematically more impacted. And here, I also wanted to emphasize this number, which of course is specific to San Diego, but this is some, the same pattern is seen in other places in the US, for example. We see that in San Diego, the total, like the total population, um, as when we look at the total population, 0.3% of the population actually composed of people experiencing homelessness. But when you look at emergency department visits uh, in San Diego, 12% is driven by this community. 
by individuals experiencing homelessness. This is just to highlight the huge burden that this community is experiencing. And when there is a wildfire, this burden is going to be exacerbated. So this is just what I wanted to emphasize here. The environmental justice, very important environmental justice implication of air pollution in general, but specifically in relation to wildfire smoke PM 2.5. So finally, I will take three minutes just to wrap up and uh, describe, discuss about the research gaps and future research direction. So what us, like uh, wildfire researchers, are working on nowadays and what we're trying to, to disentangle. So first, as I said before, there are multiple health issues that we still don't understand and also multiple pre-existing susceptibility factors. So there is a lot of interest and a lot of research nowadays in relation to wildfire and mental health. I just see a few scoping reviews or systematic reviews that have been conducted specifically on that aspect, if you're interested, but that is a very active area of research. There are many susceptibility factors for which a lot of research is going right now, including on people uh, living with Alzheimer, the Alzheimer's disease and related dementia, or people living with diabetes or cancer survivors to try to understand how people that have been diagnosed with cancer may have a differential su survival probability in relation to being exposed or not to, to wildfire smoke. So there is a very, like, this is a very active area of research right now. And so in the next few years, there will be a lot of evidence about which subgroups of the community are going to be systematically more vulnerable. And then one very important thing that I wanted to mention is a huge discrepancy, a huge inequality in terms of what we know uh, globally. So here, this is just a figure that I think tells a quite compelling story. On the top, this is like between 1997 and 2015, where most of the largest fires are concentrated. So of course, we can see that you have a lot of fires in, uh, in some region, like in Australia, a little bit in, in Canada, in California. But you see that you have a lot of regions, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, in which, and in the Amazon region, for example, or in, in Latin America more generally, that have a lot of fire. And in the top part of this figure, this is where most of the epidemiological evidence is located. And you can see this quite cl clear pattern. And here we just wanted to emphasize how we need more epidemiological evidence. We need to understand what is happening, especially in places that concentrate the largest number of fires. For an example, one country that actually has a huge number of fires and for which we have absolutely no idea what is going on is Angola and multiple countries in sub-Saharan Africa. This is something that we really, really need to understand. And the fire ecology, so the seasonality of fires and even the composition of wildfire smoke PM2 may be totally different. So we really need to understand that. And Presently, we have no idea. So that's something that I wanted to emphasize. And um, yeah, other topics that have been studied right now are just besides PM 2.5, which I talked a lot about today, there are other types of pollutants that are problematic in the context of wildfire smoke. And just briefly, that include tropospheric ozone, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and other types of pollutants, and specifically, uh, there are synergies and the con this concept of mixtures in relation to wildfire smoke is something that receives a lot of attention right now. As I mentioned before, there is also this concept of co-exposure and common compound impact in extreme heat. So what happens when you have a wildfire smoke event at the same time as a heat wave? What, are, what will be the synergistic impact? So we published a study a few weeks ago, I think it was published like three weeks ago, where we demonstrated that, we demonstrated this and quantified the synergistic impact, of course, in, uh, again, in a context of California, but we just show how when you have a wildfire event and when we have a heat event, the so impact at the population level is not going to be just the sum of, of these two climate hazards. It's going to be more than that. So demonstrating this concept of synergistic impact. So this is something that I saw receives a lot of attention right now and needs to be replicated in other contexts and also try to understand, yeah, um, wh what can we do about that? And one idea would be to develop and design what we can call like joint warning system to try to combine efforts in relation to heat warning system and so smoke warning system, which is what is being discussed and developed right now, you know, at least in the context of California. Uh, and finally, and that will be my last point, and I should be on time. Uh, this is, so what I mentioned to date, and so, so far is really thinking about wildfire as a kind of acute, like very short term problem. So we have uh, a wildfire, we have the smoke, and it's going to affect the community for a few days or a few weeks maximum. 
But as I mentioned before, there are multiple communities because of climate change in the context of climate change, wildfire smoke is not an exceptional or rare event anymore. And we need to start understanding what happens when we have communities being repeatedly exposed to wildfire, like wildfires years or months after months. And this is something for which we have absolutely no evidence right now, because wildfires cannot be just considered as a traditional source of air pollution, because it's not something that is happening every day, but it's, at the same time, it's not something that is happening every 10 years. So you have some communities in California that will be every year, year after year, being ex like exposed to wildfire smoke events. So we really need to understand these long-term issues on mental health, but also on chronic diseases and a specific type of cardiometabolic complication, for example, or Alzheimer's dementia issues. And to do that, actually, this is, that has been published literally a few days ago. We actually proposed uh, a, a different types of metrics and how we can actually analyze this kind of long-term exposure to wildfire PM2.5, taking into consideration this very like strange nature of this exposure, because it's very like just like most of the days during the year you won't have any exposure, but and suddenly you will have huge amount of wildfire smoke PM2.5. So we need new exposure metrics to quantify that. So we proposed a few. And we illustrated that in the context of environmental justice application, but we propose that so we can study this kind of new issue of long-term exposure or repeated exposure to wildfire smoke PM2.5. And I think this is my last slide and I think I'm good on time. So thank you a lot. So I hope uh, you learned something about wildfire, air quality and human health, including what we, we know for sure and why this is a big issue and also what we are trying to understand nowadays. So I think we have some time for questions, if I understand correctly, but I will stop talking right now. Thank you, Tarek, for this um, holistic uh, presentation of the, of the wildfires and health. Um, also, I would like to welcome everyone. My name is Susanna. I'm also one of the moderators. So thank you also for being, all of you for being here. Uh, thank you all for your questions. I know there are a lot. We and only take a couple of right now, and then we'll ask our presenter to address them later on the rest. Um, so one question is about if there is any uh, chemical characterizations uh, that you have done or other studies have done in terms of PM 2.5 associated with uh, uh, wildfires. And if there are any, some um, chemical components that are usually found on PM2.5 uh, during what fires and whether these have been associated with higher toxicity in terms of public health. Yep, so usually, so this is wood smoke basically. And so the first level, so when we think about the chemical composition of PM2.5, for example, in relation to wildfire smoke, it will be mostly black carbon and typically like the mix, type of mixtures that you typically have in the context of yeah, just like, um, yeah, traditional type of combustion. Just let's say just because my point is that this is not the most important aspect of composition and the fact that this is black carbon versus different types of heavy metals, etc. So what is really important is, is, and this is what some studies have been doing, is to quantify what we call the oxidative potential. So independently of the composition is what is a, like the potential harm, like harmful effect and a PM is going to like a PM mixture is going to have on you and it's going to this is really what we are trying to capture right now to try to explain how wildfire smoke pm2.5 is going to to have an impact however there is uh, recent evidence from a few months ago showing how the soil and the geology actually matters as well and there was this study showing how in some context wildfire taking place in some in some regions uh, would be where the soil would be composed with different types of heavy metals including cadmium actually could explain some of the higher toxicity of wildfire pm 2.5 so this is but that is relatively new as a scientific results but the soil the geology the soil composition in terms of heavy heavy metals may also eventually possibly play a role to explain this differential toxicity Thank you. Um, I think this also connected with another type of questions. We get the, the similar questions around whether there's any difference in the toxicity of wildfire smoke with um, uh, wood burning um, smoke, especially the wood burning stove or any other biomass uh, burning. I don't know if you have any insight on that. Yeah, unfortunately, yes, this is okay. And this is, yeah, I'm just unfortunate because most of the time, 
uh, wood smoke as a source of heat or cooking is not is not um, like something we can easily just like switch from. But unfortunately, yeah, there is a lot of um, evidence about how wood smoke uh, that is could be used for heat, heating purposes or cooking purposes can be a huge issue of air pollution indoor or outdoor. And that's that's an issue. So the 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 pattern is not as uh, the, the differential toxicity is not as high as as for a wildfire smoke. But that's an issue. I also wanted to mention that this differential toxicity and this kind of uh, movement, uh, trying to argue that we should switch away from PM two point five just based on the size or PM just regulated based on the size, going from PM ten, PM two point five, if three fine particles, PM zero point one, etc., which can be eventually useful just to understand at least which extent it can penetrate uh, into uh, the body system, like a body. But there was this study, like published I think last year, showing how coal emissions were also more toxic than traffic and traditional, what they call traditional sources of emission. If I remember correctly, the contrast was up to three times. So for the same concentration, PM 2.5 generated by coal industries were up to three times more toxic than traffic emissions, for example. So this is just to show that this is not satisfactory anymore to regulate, study, and think about PM 2.5 just based on the size. The composition and source of emission actually matters. So this is really what we are. Yeah, this is where we are right now. And of course, today, mostly talked about wildfire. And of course, in California, air pollution is a wildfire problem nowadays. So that's why I've, I, mentioned, I mentioned that. But in other settings, like in the eastern part of the US, coal industries are quite a big issue in terms of air quality. But that's beyond the scope of what we talked about today. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so before we let you uh, for now, uh, just if you can very briefly answer or address if there is any uh, activity or protective factors for people to protect from wildfires and whether the use of mask or uh, you know high uh, efficiency mask can be used as a mitigation um, to protect public health from exposure to wildfire smoke. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, just like some. So if, there will be like different levels of, at the, I will start by the community level. So of course, the best prevention is to start a fire for like to like from starting in the first place. So that would be something that, that is something that actually is ideal. So it depends on the, the, the reason for which a wildfire is going to start. So for example, in California, we have two types of fire regimes. So let's say, just to simplify, we have the forest fires that will be mostly like triggered and starting because of lightning. And that is very hard to prevent. And that is very difficult. Uh, but on the other hand, you have some, a lot of traditional uh, practices, including what we call prescribed fire, just to do some kind of proactive uh, fire activity, just to control the intensity and uh, the spread of different type of fire. So that would be something that could be, that is actually experimented and has been shown to reduce the intensity and genera generation of a smoke PM 2.5 following a fire, this type of preventive prescribed fire. Th but then in like, non-forest fire regimes, like what we have, for example, in Southern California, uh, most fires are actually going to, to be triggered to start because of like the electrical grid uh, dysfunction. So there will be basically an like, electrical cable because you have these strong winds that so we just like have this cable falling down on a huge amount of vegetation that is totally dry and ready to burn out. And this is most of the time what will start a big wildfire in Southern California. And now what is being experiment, experimented is how uh, we can actually use uh, meteorological forecasting and try to stop, uh, like do some preventive power outage to stop this kind of like the activity in a specific power grid when we suspect a huge amount of wind just to prevent these old cables to fall down and start a fire. So that would be the kind of the primary one. Then when the smoke, when we can do that and the smoke is generated and come to the city, there will be the community actions. And what is being tested right now is to have in the same vein as cooling centers, which we do when there is a heat wave, we, we have, we open libraries, we open uh, different types of public places so people can go and have like air conditioned 
area. We are experimenting the same right now with like very high quality filtration uh, rooms. So people can go and for multiple hours have a very like high quality air. So during the fire and the smoke events. So that's, that will be one thing. And then at home, of course, it's a good idea to stay at home when there is a wildfire smoke event. This is what is recommended by the warning system. So you should listen to, to, to the like to any channel of information that can get get access to. And usually we recommend to uh, like minimize or, or reduce during the like the smoke event, any physical activity, stay inside, wear uh, like FFP2 mask or like a um, 95 mask, which now is quite not, uh, taboo anymore as following the COVID, which is one of the only few co-benefits of COVID-19. And uh, so that is what uh, could be recommended. Another thing that I would recommend that also could be recommended is in prevention of a smoke event is also to remove uh, as much as possible dust inside the house. And that is to reduce the generation of secondary pollutants. Because of, of course, when there is a smoke event, the smoke doesn't stay outside, it penetrates inside the house. And then this PM and this smoke is going to start interacting with the dust and other sources of contamination inside the house. And that could lead to a lot of secondary pollutants like VOCs, etc. So one thing that you can do at the individual level, besides wearing a mask during the smoke event and reducing your physical activity and is to before the fire or the smoke co comes, just to remove dust. So basically to do a very quite cl intense cleaning before the fire stops. So just to reduce the generation of these secondary pollutants. So this that would be my package Thank of formulation. About what very nice tips. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Tarek. So we can now move on to our case studies. So, um, We'll move on to our case studies, and then at the very end, we'll gather the questions, and then we'll leave all questions for both uh, case studies at the end. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Susana Viegas. Um, we we'll talked about wildfires in Portugal. Dr. Susana Viegas is an assistant professor and researcher at the Nova National School of Public Health, Department of Occupation and Environmental Health and a member of the Comprehensive Health Research Center. She has a PhD in public health, a master's in toxicology and occupational health, and a bachelor's degree in environmental health. She's also a European registered toxicology. She's involved as a researcher and working in several working packages and tasks in the EU uh, projects. Um, she's a member of the European Chemicals Agency Committee for Risk Assessment and of the Scientific Committee of the European Environmental Agency in the topic of environment and health chemicals. And since 2021, she has been collaborating as a visiting scientist with the Monographs Program of the International Agency for Research on Cancer or of the World Health Organization. Um, and lastly, uh, she's also a member of the Technical Advisory Group on Occupational Burden of Disease Estimation of the World Health Organization. Um, Susanna, your floor is yours. Thank you so much, Susanna, and I hope you can hear me well and everyone else. So thank you so much for this invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And the invitation was to present the case study of Portugal. So this, my beautiful country is indeed uh, every year suffering of wildfires and many factors contribute for this. Uh, I think the risk is indeed increasing. And the factors that are contributing more for this um, phenomena is the changing in the land use and management practice, changing in the vegetation cover, and as well, a climate change phenomenon. And I guess one of the issues that we need also to consider, and in the case of Portugal is very relevant, is the fact that rural areas are being abandoned. So people is living, are living more in the literal uh, area. And because of that, they abandon the, the lands. Lands are getting uh, more uh, the kind of uh, vegetation that promotes and facilitates the wildfires. Also, the aging of the rural population is also a factor to, to consider. And the, the last sentence here is also to to bring to, to your attention the, the aspect of biodiversity loss and the fact that we are very much investing in monoculture like this one, eucalyptus, 
also facilitate the spread and intensity of wildfires. So it's also forest team management um, uh, actions that can also contribute to prevent the, the wildfires, but also to facilitate wildfires. And of course, climate change also contributes to the growing concern about wildfires and the risk or the increased risk in my country. And of course, the extreme weather events has enhanced the conditions for extreme wildfires and favor the spread and the intensity of wildfires on several occasions. I think one of the, the fires that were more um, discussed, I think, in the media in the world was, were the wildfires in 2017. That indeed was a very impactful. We lost 100 lives, and it was indeed something of um, uh, high concern in the in all the public health um, population, technicians, but also uh, at the citizens' level. But heat waves, dry weather, changing rain, and wind patterns in Portugal have also been associated with the occurrence of more extreme fire seasons. This is very much related with the talk that Professor Tariq presented before, and all these events that also happen in California also happens in Portugal. And of course, these are increasing the, the risk of wildfires. So these extreme weather conditions also make wildfires more difficult to control. It is indeed an, a challenge for our firefighters to deal with wildfires in Portugal. And because also the vegetation that is being involved in the wildfires is something that is, was not happening before. Indeed, the kind of conditions that climate change uh, contributes makes, for instance, the cork oaks, that is a tree very important for us because we are one of the most um, relevant producers of cork in the world. Even these kind of trees are being affected. So it is indeed a, a public health problem, but also economical problem. So here, uh, our our country, and here you can see the, the wildfire hazard map. And it is a, a map that we use to identify where the risk is higher. And indeed, corresponds with the, the locations in Portugal where normally occurs uh, more wildfires. Uh, for instance, I can say in my last summer of vacations, I was in the south of the country, this this area here, and I was surprised with the big wildfire and all the involvement that implies to the population, even for us that were having vacations there, it was even it was indeed something of high concern. But of course, we have to do foresight, and indeed the, the scene is not very famous, and we see that increasing the temperature increase our risk of wildfire. So you, you can see here as Portugal, all the peninsula. Iberica is being affected with increased temperatures and all the all the years and the previous years we have seen besides Portugal also in Spain uh, big wildfires and with high impact. Just some numbers for you these are not the most relevant numbers of course uh, I was mentioned the, the lives that we lost in these wildfires of 2017 but still it's it is also an economical issue we lost a lot of um, resources that are important for people that live nearby the, the regions where the wildfire happens. And of course, this uh, has an impact in their quality of life. So you can see here some of the numbers. And of course, very much already discussed by Professor Tariq, uh, there is a, an impact on the air pollution. And uh, for Portugal, is of course something that has been discussed in several research projects, but also our public health professions are, are aware of this issue. And normally is expected that after a wildfire, fire, a population suffers of several health issues or even their health issues, chronic base health issues are getting worse due to the exposure to the fumes of a wildfire. And um, this was already presented, but uh, it is something that it is a, a concern because it affects not only the, the population that lives in the surrounding of the wildfire, but can have an impact in the in the far away in the in the in people living uh, far from the wildfire. So these are, this of course has an impact in human health in the Portuguese population. 
Uh, we have discussed this before. Can aggravate asthma, trigger lung disease, cause heart attacks, and lead to premature death? These are some pictures of our wildfires of last year. As you can see, it's even a, a terrible uh, image, and uh, unfortunately, something more frequently that we would like to that happen in our country. And something that I would like to present here is a work that was developed by IARC uh, in 2022. And uh, the, the, the aim of this work was to evaluate concerning carcinogenicity, the activity as a fire factor. And indeed, the, the science that is already published allowed to conclude that working as a firefighter is a carcinogenic agent and linked with lung and bladder cancer. And if we consider that more people is engaged in fighting wildfires as a profession, uh, these, of course, also have an impact and an increase uh, in, the, in the burden of disease. So besides general population that is exposed to the fumes coming from a wildfire, also firefighters, a group, professional group, is also in an increased risk of having uh, health effects related with the exposure to, to fumes and then pollutants coming from a, a wildfire. But we learn, uh, unfortunately, with some of our previous wildfires, and we have taken measures to prevent new uh, events like the ones that happened in 2017. So at the EU level, uh, funding for wildfire prevention has increased. And uh, thanks to a new uh, group of EU policies on climate change and risk prevention. So you can see here the increase uh, on some of the measures to, to handle uh, wildfires, but also to prevent wildfires. And we can see uh, some increase in, in the prevention part. Um, and since 2020, also the Agriculture Fund has allocated a higher percentage of funding to EU ter territories vulnerable to wildfires like Portugal. And of course, also other resources have been uh, attributed to protect the, the forestry and with this, prevent wildfires. So there is something that we are doing and uh, also at the national level, the wildfire management practice in Portugal have significantly improved and um, risk assessments have become more thorough with more information, using that information in a, in a more detailed manner. And of course, these technological advancements and the less lessons learned allow us to have these more accurate results uh, act preventably, not expecting that the wildfire occurs, and these allow us to prevent, of course, in a more effective way, the uh, wildfires. Also, the hazard map that I showed to you in the in the beginning of my presentation has been adapted. It's now more real and um, based on the on the data that we are having, and these, of course, allow us to define priorities and to to refine our preventive measures in the field. And Portugal is currently working on developing a wildfire risk map, as well projections of future wildfire hazard, of course, taking in consideration the evolutions on heat waves and other climate phenomena that can promote the wildfires. This is, taking on, is being taken on board and that allow us to, to take measures in a, in a preventive manner. And I guess one of the most important issues is the fact that we now communicate more and better. And we try to create an awareness in the population, try to, to avoid uh, activities and actions that can result in a wildfire. We try to educate population also to avoid the, the, the risks that result from a wildfire. And I think this is, is something of uh, high success in the last years that can uh, bring us uh, an important example, at least at uh, my country. And I think this is my last slide. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to, to answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll move on to the second case study and then we'll see the questions at the end. So I want to welcome Dr. George uh, Zaharidis from the University of Sicily in, in Greece. Um, he's a qualified production and management engineer from the Technical University of Crete with a master's and doctorate degree from Ecole uh, Centrale Paris. 
His research activity focuses on the development of mathematical decomposition methods and solving mathematical programming problems that arise in applications areas such as transportation, industrial production, biology, electricity markets. His research activity also focuses on environmental issues, uh, specifically in pollutants in road transport. He also developed air quality monitoring unit um, to monitor airborne microparticles up to 2.5 microns, as well as other particulate and, and gaseous uh, pollutants. Thank you very much. Let me let me share my, my screen first. Sorry. Here we are. So I uh, welcome uh, everybody. Thank, thank you for, for the invitation. I will try to be fast because I think we have 10 minutes. Am I correct? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so I, I will uh, try to give you a short uh, description of uh, the case study of uh, Volo City. Volo City is in the center of, uh, of Greece. Uh, and uh, we have uh, several issues uh, every year uh, concerning uh, wildfires. Not only here, but in general, in Greece, maybe the situation here is similar or maybe worse than in Portugal or in uh, California. Um, I'm not going to spend the uh, time explaining you why uh, particular matters are uh, very important and uh, what are the, um, you know, what is, uh, what are the results to our health. Uh, the only thing that uh, I want you to keep in your mind um, through this um, slide is uh, the guidelines of the World Health Organization concerning uh, the limits of uh, PM uh, 2.5. Um, in an annual base, uh, the average should be less than five uh, micrograms per cubic meter, and in a daily base, uh, no more than uh, 15 micrograms per uh, meter uh, uh, per uh, cubic uh, meter. Uh, another thing, uh, it's pretty well explained by, by the other professors, um, well, how, why PM2.5 are very dangerous for, for our for our uh, for our health and uh, what are the potential uh, results so i'm not going to give you more details on that <clears throat> uh, what we are doing here in the university of thessaly actually we 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 have a uh, funding from the european commission um, in order to develop a network around greece um, so what we are doing uh, the last years is to 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 try to cover the the most part uh, of the greece uh, concerning uh, the air quality monitoring and more specifically to to calculate to to monitor actually the p uh, the levels of uh, pm 2.5 um, there are several researchers uh, included in uh, to this project uh, concerning the university of thessaly we have uh, our department the mechanical engineering department the electrical engineering department of course we have the department of, of medicine it's very important to have uh, you know doctors to 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 understand uh, more uh, what are the the impact of uh, pm 2.5 to, to our health so what we are trying is to monitor uh, the levels of uh, pm 2.5 around greece and uh, try to correlate uh, the health impact and the levels of uh, of pm uh, so the, the the case study that I'm going to present you um, was here in the city of Folos. The last summer we had uh, two major uh, wildfires um, which uh, broke out in the area of uh, Magnesia, uh, in the region of Magnesia where uh, where Folos is uh, um, is the capital of of this of this region. Um, the the wildfires was in uh, Almiros, a city near to to, to Volos, and in Velestino, a, a city next to Almiros and near to Volos, of course. Um, the unfortunately the the fires managed to reach uh, near Hialos uh, Air Base, and we had uh, a lot of issues there because we have uh, fighters. Uh, fighter aircrafts over there that they they, they were ordered to to move uh, from from the airport and go to to another region, um, but um, the the fires uh, managed to reach also uh, the industrial zone of Volos, which is around five kilometers far away from from the city of uh, Volos. We have uh, as usual. Uh, 
we have to evacuate uh, several uh, regions um, and cities. Uh, the most, uh, the, the biggest city that was evacuated was uh, Neahielos, where two thousand, where sorry, eight eight thousand uh, citizens uh, had uh, to move. The the wildfire started on uh, July twenty sixth uh, at the evening. Uh, they ended. Uh, thanks God. <laughs> uh, the next morning, so it was not a long, uh, um, a long. Uh, let's say didn't take a long, a lot of time to 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 stop the the fire, which is not uh, unfortunately it's not very usual uh, here in Greece. In general, we spend uh, maybe two or three days to 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 stop this kind of uh, white fires. Uh, here are some uh, pictures uh, taken uh, near uh, the city of Volos. Um, here is uh, Neon Hielos, and here at the second one, uh, at the bottom is um, is the industrial zone of uh, Volos. You, you cannot see um, the, um, uh, the the place because there is a lot of uh, smoke. But uh, behind the smoke, uh, there are a lot of uh, buildings uh, where. Uh, they, they they produce every day several kind of uh, products. Uh, the city of Olos um, is uh, ten kilometers uh, away from the was actually uh, ten kilometers uh, away from the fire front. Uh, the average concentration for the last five years, we have all, all the numbers that we we present in this uh, these slides. Um, are uh, obtained by our network, uh, the network that we have developed in order to monitor the level of uh, P, uh, PM uh, 2.5. So the, the last five years, the, the average concentration uh, for the last five years, for the same days and hours, at the city of Volo was uh, 4.2 micrograms per um, uh, cubic uh, meters. We are during the summer, the weather is nice and the pollution is very very low but the average concentration uh, of the same pollutant of pm 2.5 during the wildfires uh, in the city of Volos was almost four times higher than uh, the usual as you see uh, the impact of the wildfires to the city of Volos was extremely uh, significant and um, as we will see at the end of this presentation um, we, we recorded at the hospital of uh, Volus uh, significant increase concerning the emergency de department uh, visits. Uh, another another interesting um, number is uh, actually is um, uh, what is the fluctuation of uh, of um, the levels of uh, PM two point five? As you see, we have uh, three main peaks. Uh, during the wildfire, uh, where uh, the PM 2.5 reached uh, more than uh, 80 um, uh, micrograms per, per cubic uh, meters. Uh, we have um, in the beginning, uh, the first peak, uh, um, uh, between 5.30 and 6 uh, uh, p.m. and uh, during the night, between 11 p.m. and uh, 1 a.m. Uh, during three uh, three periods, uh, the 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 level of uh, PMs was significantly uh, high, and of course one of the main reasons uh, was that uh, was the wind direction and the wind uh, the wind velocity, which move uh, uh, the smoke uh, into the city. Uh, another uh, another place where was which was uh, significantly affected, as I said before, was the industrial zone of uh, Volos, which. Uh, was five kilometers away from the fire front. The average concentration for the last five years for, for the same days and same hours at the industrial zone of, uh, Vol of Volos was uh, 3.2 micrograms per cubic uh, meter. And unfortunately, uh, the average <coughs> concentration during uh, the wildfires was uh, 20 times higher than, uh, than usual, as you see. Uh, the, the the problem that actually the the the, the quality of uh, of um, of the air was significant uh, affected uh, due to the uh, uh, wild uh, fires. Here we have the similar uh, the similar um, numbers for the similar graph for for, uh, for the industrial zone of walls where we see uh, similar um, actually concerning the time uh, similar. Uh, peaks. Uh, we have uh, four main peaks uh, of uh, PM 2.5 levels. Um, we have in the beginning of the wildfire, 
we have between five and five thirty and six o'clock at the evening, from um, eleven p.m. to one a.m. and we had the fourth peak um, by the end of uh, of the fire uh, of the of the fire at the beginning of uh, of the next day. Um, same reason, you same same conditions during during this uh, period. So we have. Uh, um, a wind, uh, the, the wind direction and the wind uh, velocity uh, bring uh, brought actually the, um, the the smoke into into the city. Um, before I give you some uh, specific numbers concerning the um, let's say the, the impact to 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 the citizens uh, of uh, Volos concerning the the health impact, um, uh, we, I will give you some, um, let's say, nominal uh, data that we have collected. Actually, every year, what we are doing here in uh, in the University of uh, Thessal is to collect uh, all this data concerning the, the level of uh, uh, PM 2.5, and at the same time, uh, record all the um, emergency department, department uh, visits, which uh, could be considered uh, as um, uh, visits uh, that uh, may be uh, occurred due to high level of uh, PM 2.5. So, and and what we are doing is we try to tolerate uh, the, the the level of PM and the emergency department visit. As you see here, and this is the main reason that I present you this uh, this graph is uh, the the level of uh, of of PM. The, the blue line uh, actually <coughs> follows uh, almost all the time uh, the the lines of uh, of the emergency department uh, visit. So it's obvious that um, and, and we have similar graphs for 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 the other for other years. Um, uh, it's obvious that. Um, uh, the, the the increased levels of uh, of PM affect uh, really fast uh, the health of uh, citizens and uh, this is uh, recorded also to the emergency department of uh, of the hospital here in uh, in Volos. Um, some other examples is that uh, let me see how much time I have. Some some other numbers is that um, here we have also of course. Uh, uh, classify all the emergency department visits. Uh, here is uh, we have visits uh, that uh, people with, for people that they have asthma or they ha they have a pneumonia. Um, so we see always a significant increase when the the, the level of PM is uh, a significant high. Let's say more than twenty five micrograms per cubic meter. We, we choose the 25 micrograms per cubic meter because this is the limit by the Greek uh, law. Of course, the World Health Organization gives uh, much shorter uh, limits. So if we take, uh, uh, if we take the, the guidelines of uh, uh, WHO, uh, as you understand, the increase will be much, much uh, higher concerning the emergency department visits. But even if we take the, the numbers, the limits uh, that uh, are um, uh, valid here in, uh, in Greece, we see, for example, uh, more than 40%, an increase of uh, 40%, 42% concerning the emergency department visits when uh, the, the PM is higher than 25 uh, micrograms per uh, cubic meter. Uh, another interesting thing is that um, what 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 we are studying is another interesting thing. What is the cumulative um, effect uh, effect uh, of uh, high levels of uh, PM two point five? Um, I, I don't have a lot of time to explain you all, all the numbers, but uh, if, for example, um, the, the first day. Uh, any any first day, uh, the PM are higher than twenty five micrograms per cubic meter, and um, the day after the second day, we have uh, fifty percent higher PM uh, two point five than in the first day. Uh, then the third day, uh, if we compare with the uh, with uh, the annual average, we see an increase almost forty percent concerning the emergency department uh, visit. So, if we compare the same numbers with uh, with the days that uh, the, the 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 air is cleaner, that means that 
that the PM 2.5 are less than 25 micrograms uh, per cubic meter, we see an increase of uh, 62. So uh, as uh, as we understand, there is a high co correlation between uh, um, um, between the the emergency, the emergency department visits and uh, the 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 sequence of uh, multiple days that the uh, PM two point five are are high. Uh, the last slide uh, shows some uh, numbers concerning um, concerning the day of uh, of the wildfires. Uh, the number of emergency department visits increased significantly compared to the average uh, visits of the last five years. As, as you can see, uh, we have uh, an increase of 120% uh, concerning the emergency department visits. We have almost 95% uh, increase for the uh, for emergency department visits related to URI. And uh, we have an increase of 145% uh, concerning uh, emergency department visits related to, to asthma. As, as you understand, um, the, 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 the problem with uh, the citizens' uh, health uh, during these uh, wildfires was really important, and this is recorded also to the uh, central hospital of, uh, of the city of Olmos. I think I was fast. Uh, if you have anything, any, any question, please Thank feel you. To, to ask. Thank you, Yairis. Uh, okay, so uh, I think we can address one question each hour uh, presented for case study. So I'll start with um, Dr. Villegas first. Uh, one question is asking, do you feel that wildfires are being taken seriously by the EU policymakers and also the national governments? And if not, what more sh uh, should they be doing? I thank you for the question. It's not an easy question, of course. Uh, I would say that the national European level, I think it's now being more and more uh, tackled in the EU policies. Of course, there is always something to, to do, more things to, to improve. But one of the, the main aspects is that the policies are important, but more important than having good policies to implement uh, those policies at the national level. And I think sometimes it's difficult mainly because we have different realities in the EU countries. And of course, this needs some adaptation when we implement those policies. And so I, I guess it's improving, but we still have uh, room for improvement. I think that is the correct answer from my side. Thank you. Thank you. It is indeed a difficult question. Okay, thank you. Um, and then moving on to Dr. Saharidis. Um, I think it's more a clarification. Um, um, during January and February 2020, the concentrations of PM2.5 were lowest, but pediatric patients were highest. I don't know if you can explain that, or if you have any insights or comments. Yes, uh, I don't have a straightforward answer because we analyzed the data, but um, uh, because we have several sets of uh, data, but if 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 it's necessary to give a, a really fast answer right now, my my opinion is that uh, uh, the cumulative effect uh, increased the the emergency department visit during February, and uh, this was um, the reason that we see that a, a decrease concerning the PM two point five, but. The, the 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 emergency department visits uh, continue to increase during uh, February, so the cumulative effect uh, is the one that make uh, people sick. Actually, a lot of days uh, we we have a really high uh, levels of uh, PM uh, two point five. Let me give you one one more uh, number. During January and February, there was not let's say maximum. It was. There was two or three days that uh, the PM was lower. The, the PM level was the average of PM um, per day was uh, less than twenty five uh, micrograms per cubic meter. So we are talking about very very um, you know problematic uh, uh, days. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, being here, and thank you all to our presenters. I will try to address all the questions and share them with you. Um, 
and see you next week.